Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Sean Brown, and I am the head coach or CEO at YCharts. I am super excited to be joined by one of the smarter people I've ever met, especially related to capital markets and, and a whole lot of really interesting topics. I am joined by Lizanne Saunders, who is the chief investment strategist at Charles Schwab. Lizanne, hello. Hi, Sean. Thank you for that very kind or too kind introduction, but happy to be here. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's a big honor when um, I, I lead a company that's all, all about uh, understanding capital markets and helping our clients understand capital markets. And as Liz and I have gotten to know each other and um, and prep for this, um, boy, I've learned a lot from Lizanne. So thanks a ton. Um, we are going to be covering a wide range of topics, um, everything from macroeconomic considerations to perspectives on earnings to interest rates, um, uh, employment, recessions, et cetera. Um, but before we dive into things, I did want to make sure we cover just a couple housekeeping things. First of all, uh, I am obligated to tell you that this is meant for educational purposes only and is not meant to be used as investment advice. Um, Y charts is not acting as an advising party re, uh, regarding client funds in any way, shape, or form. Um, number two is if for whatever reason you need to hop off of this webinar, um, a recording will be made available to everyone via an email, which we will send tomorrow. Um, it will also be available on replay on our YouTube channel. So please remember to subscribe and like. So you don't miss out on any of our uh, newly released videos. This will be the best of the videos that YCharts has, though, and I, I will guarantee that. Um, last thing I'd point out to you is we do have QR code at the top of uh, most screens. If you care to learn more about YCharts or take a demo, please go ahead and click on that. But um, why don't we get started? So we're going to be talking about uh, a dozen slides, and we're going to be talking about uh, in, in the categories of, you know, the markets. Um, one of the things YCharts does is we produce every quarter an economic deck, which we uh, allow and, and encourage our customers to white label and adjust as they see fit. We've plucked a handful of slides from there that we want to share some perspectives on. And then last, we want to talk about we're uh, two weeks short of the end of Q2 earnings season. We want to talk a little bit about earnings and, and a few stock related topics. Lizanne, you ready to dive in? I'm ready. Go for it. All right. Well, let's talk about the markets. So um, uh, the, don't fight the Fed. So the adage has always held true and held true in the 2010s that um, when the Fed is raising interest rates, markets go down. We certainly saw that in 2020. Um, as 2023 has emerged, rates have continued to go up, but so has the market. Um, does that old adage hold true anymore, Lizanne? It, it, it does, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't operate in lockstep. You have to remember that essentially monetary policy itself is not a lagging indicator. In fact, the effects of what the Fed does and other central banks are ultimately in the future, the, the whole concept of long and variable lags. But the reality is what the Fed is reacting to in tightening policy, meaning inflation, is inherently a lagging indicator. And of course, the stock market is a leading indicator. So Yes, there was there was lockstep in terms of last year, given the start of the hiking cycle, which has turned into the most aggressive in more than 40 years, and a bear market that unfolded. I think the the rally since last October's lows had several underpinnings to it, but as it relates to monetary policy, it's not abnormal for the market to start to rebound in anticipation of the Fed ending a hiking. A cycle. Sometimes that the rally falters if you ultimately get a, a recession, or if the Fed has to become aggressive again after maybe a period of pause. But to see the market rally before the Fed is actually done is not abnormal relative to history because of that anticipatory nature of the stock market. 
Yeah, and I, that's obviously an important thing for investors to keep in mind. It's not just what's going on, it's anticipating what will be going on and how much of that do you believe the market has already incorporated. So if we talk about those rate heights, this is a simple picture to show the numerous rate heights we've seen since March of, of 22. And I am one of those Americans who um, oh, should have been paying more attention to my five-year arm mortgage rate, which uh, I, I, I'm now looking uh, and regretting quite a bit. But what are your perspectives on how the Fed has handled these rate hikes and kind of what do you predict to come? So I, I think that there's a lot of armchair quarterbacking that happens uh, with regard to the Fed, probably more so now than historically, and, and, and maybe in part because the Fed, in essence, admits that they probably waited a bit too long to start to tighten policy via rate hikes and shrinking the balance sheet. But that's armchair quarterbacking. You know, that's we 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 can all go back and say would have, should have, could have, but here we are, and the Fed has had to be particularly aggressive in part because maybe they waited a little bit too long and stayed at the zero bound too long. Um, you know, transparency has been extraordinary, but a little bit different this time relative to the past couple of cycles, where their transparency actually included sort of a laid out path for what monetary policy would look like both on the upside and the downside. This one's been a bit different because the Fed is expressing that they're data dependent. And as the data comes in, they will assess what they need to do. We knew what they were doing in the early stage. We knew they were gonna be aggressive, both the periodicity of rate hikes, as well as the, the size of some of those hikes. But now that we're in some semblance of pause mode or skip mode, where they're assessing on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis, the incoming data, um, we, we have to bring actually the spotlight away from just inflation to now inflation and the labor market. Because you have to remember the Fed has a dual mandate. The um, stable prices basically is, is the sort of official terminology of the mandate and full employment, but basically the labor market and inflation. And the labor market was sort of off to the side when we were dealing with 40 year highs and in inflation and the Fed was in that aggressive mode. Now that they've at least taken a step back um, I think we have to keep the inflation picture and the labor market picture um, look with with a similar lens. And that's sort of where we are in the cycle. Uh, I'm not sure the Fed is is finished yet, but they're probably getting close. OK, that was interesting. I was going to ask you, what what do you think? What's your crystal ball hole of the head? It sounds like they're not well, done, but maybe close. They So with the um, latest economic data that's come out, which has been a bit better than expected, you did see an adjustment to probabilities around not the September Fed meeting, but the November Fed meeting. So the September Fed meeting, it still looks like it's about 85, 90% probability of no hike. And that's, there's an interesting tool, the CME tool, and it, it on a minute to minute basis updates based on positioning in the Fed funds futures market and infers a probability of the next meeting, the meeting after that. But interestingly, you did see a pretty meaningful move up in probability of a November hike. So right now, the assessment by the market is uh, maybe one more. I think importantly, where there may still be a disconnect in terms of what the Fed is trying to communicate and what the market has priced in is not so much the September meeting, the November meeting, but what happens next year? Right now, there's about five rate cuts priced in for 2024. And I'm, I'm not sure the Fed is going to be that quick to start cutting rates so soon after ending an aggressive hiking cycle, unless you see much more deterioration in the labor market and or the economy. So it's sort of a be careful what you wish for. If you view five rate cuts next year as, as nothing but a good thing, the conditions that would sort of generate the green light for the Fed to actually pivot to rate cuts, not just go into pause mode, I'm not sure you want to wish for those uh, conditions. That, yep, it, it, the adage holds true, careful what you wish for. Um, so this slide 
is uh, one I'd, I'd really love your perspectives on. This is since 1950, and it depicts in the top uh, what's happened in bull markets and on the bottom what's happened in bear markets. And, you know, I think the thing we can all visually see here is that uh, bear markets seem to go, the, the decline seems to be very quick and maybe reaches a lower trough than the peaks of a bull market, uh, which tend to last longer. Um, so, you know, fear and greed seems to, seems to have a, a bigger impact, but give us your perspectives on, uh, on this trend. Well, the good news is, is that bull markets are longer and stronger and bear markets are, are shorter uh, for the most part. And that's just the nature of uh, the tie into an economy that generally is in growth mode. You, you go through cycles, you have contractions, you have somewhat commensurate contractions in the stock market, either because sentiment gets too frothy or valuations get too rich. It's often tied to the economic cycle, but not with any perfect overlap. Uh, because of the leading nature of the, the stock market. I think if this were the opposite, if bull markets were shorter and weaker and bear markets were extreme, um, it, we, we wouldn't have participants in the market. But uh, we generally have a growing economy. Uh, you know, investing is by its nature an act of, of optimism. I do think that the, the emotion of, of panic and fear sometimes takes a while to kick in, but when it does, it, it can be fairly swift. And what's interesting is, Market observers and watchers and, and folks that have been in the business a long time like I have that understand the power of investor sentiment, particularly at extremes, as a base contrarian indicator, not with anything resembling perfect timing. But what's interesting is sentiment can get frothy, overly optimistic, whatever, whatever term you want to use and can stay there for a while and the market can continue to do well. Perfect example of that would be the late 1990s. You know, Greenspan made his irrational exuberance common in 1996 and the market didn't start falling apart until March of 2000. So you still had a lot of runway. Mm -hmm. On the other hand though, when things get really, really despairing, um, those tend to be shorter lived periods. So at those real extremes of despair witnessed in sentiment indicators, they've had a, a better sort of timing aspect uh, to them. Not that I'm suggesting you find a sentiment indicator and, and it's gonna tell you when to buy the market. Sentiment isn't a perfect timing tool by any means, but there tends to be a, a shorter window of, of, let's call it opportunity associated with despair, whereas you can stay in supreme optimism mode for an extended period of time. You typically don't start to fall in the opposite direction of that sentiment until there is a significant catalyst. Very, very helpful. All right, a lot of talk about prices, about inflation. Uh, this slide depicts the uh, CPI uh, since the very early days, just slightly before I was born in the, uh, in the early 1900s. Um, what can you tell us about inflation? So yeah, we, we have had a huge surge in inflation that um, does bring back memories for those that were around of the 1970s. Importantly though, the drivers this time and the drivers of the inflation problems, and I emphasize the, the plural there, in the 1970s are, are quite different. There, there are some comps that I think are worth noting, including the, uh, the, the power that, that labor seems to be garnering, um, not quite to the degree or nowhere, actually nowhere near to the degree of the 1970s when the workforce was much more unionized. Um, globalization was in the early stages. So I think there are more differences than there are similarities. But what I think that the playbook is from the Fed's perspective that does tie to the 1970s, and you can see kind of the, you know, the, the double big mountain in the 1970s, the, the, with the benefit of hindsight, the error made by the Fed under Arthur Burns was declaring victory on inflation prematurely, not just declaring victory and then staying in, let's call it pause mode, since we'd be using that term, but declaring victory and saying, okay, we can ease policy again. They eased policy, 
only to see inflation get let out of the bag again. They have to aggressively tighten policy again, mission accomplished, ease policy, boom, it happened again. And that's ultimately what led Volcker to have to come in and do what we now call pull a Volcker and, and really rocket up interest rates and bring on the back-to-back -back recessions in the early 80s. You know, this one certainly started quite differently and, and had its birth in the pandemic, but then was exacerbated by the massive stimulus, both on the monetary side and the fiscal side. And when that stimulus kicked in and the demand associated with that stimulus worked its way into the economy, if you think back three and a half years ago, all that demand and stimulus was forced to be funneled into the goods side of the economy for the simple reason that services were shut down. We didn't have any access to spending on services. That became the breeding ground for the inflation problem that we're still dealing with. However, the good side of inflation has actually gone into disinflation and many categories in outright deflation. We've just had the later strength on the services side. And you can talk about the same thing in the context of how this economic cycle has unfolded, sort of started in goods and then later went to services. I, I think we're, we're in a disinflationary environment, but maybe the most important thing I'd say is that if you think in more secular terms, what does beyond the next you know, few quarters look like? I think we're transitioning into not a period of perpetually higher inflation, but a period of greater inflation volatility. What, what led to such low inflation volatility during the 25 years up until the pandemic, the, the so-called great moderation era, that, that term coined by uh, Larry Summers, was, and I've been saying everything gelled, G-E-L. The world had abundant and cheap access to goods, energy, and labor. Mm -hmm. China was coming into the world order, globalization, and that was a powerful force that kept bringing inflation down. Now, all those ships have sailed. The world no longer has abundant and cheap access to goods, energy, or labor. And I think that just means we're likely to have more inflation volatility, probably shorter economic cycles, um, that doesn't mean there aren't opportunities. It's just a very different backdrop than what a lot of newer and not so, even so new investors are used to because that great moderation period started in the late 90s. Mm. Well, in my home, I know we're just kind of happy that eggs have returned to a little bit more reasonable level because my wife did uh, ration the amount of eggs I was able to have in the morning. Well, everybody's inflation is different. That's the other important point. You know, we can look at indexes like the CPI, but um, everybody's inflation rate is, is different depending on whether you're a homeowner or a renter. Do you, you know, commute long hours in a car and pay for energy or do you eat out a lot? So it is personal to some degree, but we do need indexes that track it in the aggregate. Yep. So I mentioned, you know, one of the things we do is we put together an economic deck with our, which our customers, uh, our subscribers can tap into and, and leverage as they see fit in communicating with their clients. Um, pulled a few slides from there and uh, I wanted to start with kind of hearing your perspectives because you touched on in the last slide, labor. How do you look at the labor metrics um, and which ones do you follow and for what reasons? Well, I follow all of them. I think everybody uh, should, but um, I think one of the first things that everybody should try to learn or understand is, and this is not just relating to labor market data, but all economic data. There's sort of three buckets you can put economic data, including labor market data in. Indicators that, that lead, those that are coincident, and those that are lagging. So what you have here are three very common labor market data points. The unemployment rate, everybody's generally familiar with that, payrolls, and then initial unemployment claims. The, the first two, the unemployment rate and payrolls are monthly data, and then of course claims is weekly data. In order, they go from being a lagging indicator, coincident indicator, and a leading indicator. So the unemployment rate. And, and here's where I think investors sometimes get tripped up because they're, they're keenly focused on economic data, especially when trying to gauge whether a slowdown is going to turn into a recession and what are the implications for the, the stock market. 
But because the unemployment rate is such a common metric, most people are quite familiar with it. I can't tell you how many times I hear people say, well, there's no way there's any recession risk with the unemployment rate at 3.4%. You know, that's got to go up a lot in order to trigger a recession. And I always think you have that opposite of what actually happens. A rising unemployment rate doesn't cause a recession. A recession happens for lots of reasons, and then it ultimately brings the unemployment rate up. And you can see that here, those gray bars are recessions. And you can see that the unemployment rate has always been near its low at the onset of recessions. The same thing happens at the other end. I can't tell you how many times I hear people say, well, there's no way the economy can be in recovery mode with a 10% unemployment rate. Well, not only is the unemployment rate typically near its high when you finish a recession, it's usually still going up because it lags. Payrolls are a coincident indicator. And you can see that the peak in payrolls has usually corresponded kind of dead on with the start of recessions. Again, making me always wonder when people say, well, payrolls have to go in deep negative territory before it's a recession signal. Well, the last 13 cycles, only two of them were payrolls in negative territory leading into recession. All the other cases, they were still rising. And in some cases, you know, triple digit because it's coincident. And then unemployment claims, and it's hard to judge against recessions here because there was such a massive spike due to the COVID that you almost need to look at sort of a truncated version of this. But unemployment claims, you do, they're, they're a leading indicator. So you do get a, a, a bit of a heads up. And so that's why it's important to, when judging where you are in the cycle, understand what leads and what lags. And then it brings up an adage of mine that I've said for ever and ever and ever, which is it's human nature for us to look at economic data and think of it in good versus bad or strong versus weak terms. But the reality is what matters is better or worse. And better or worse generally matters more than good or bad. And it certainly is one of the things that trips investors up because we'll look at the unemployment rate while it's low. We'll look at unemployment claims still low. But at the point where it stops getting better and just starts to get worse in level terms, it still looks okay, but it's the inflection point that uh, that is key. Mm. And and you mentioned the the word truncation, and as a as a company that puts together visuals and charts, like it, things are so um, thrown out of whack with the yeah. COVID charts yeah. that I, I'm sure it's a feature we'll be rolling out, which is click this box if you want to uh, cut out the COVID period, which is obscuring a lot of these things. Right. All right. Um, this slide is showing the S and P 500 in purple in relation to the 10 to uh, yield curve spread. And the theory says that when the, the spread is positive, we're gonna see economic growth. And when that spread runs into the negative, we may see uh, negative economic growth. Can you tell us a little bit about this? Sure. So, you know, a normal yield curve is when long-term interest rates are higher than short-term interest rates because, you, you need to um, incent somebody to borrow uh, for a longer period of time with a higher yield. And that's normal structure. It allows the financial system, particularly the, the banks to borrow at a lower uh, rate and then lend out at a higher rate and make that spread. And that fuels the lending environment and fuels the economy and investment, et cetera. Um, an inversion happens when the combination of maybe the Fed starting to raise interest rates and then longer term yields starting to reflect the impact that that's going to have on economic growth and starts to move down. So you get the inversion with short term interest rates higher than long term interest rates. Um, it's been a near perfect advance indicator of recessions historically. Importantly, though, there is a, a wide variability in terms of the time span from an inversion to when a recession has uh, started. Um, sometimes it's fairly short. It can be as long as nearing you know, a couple of years. So there, there's no 
okay, the yield curve inverted, boom, you know, we've got sort of perfect history of what that means in terms of, by the way, either recession or a bear market to the extent that there's some overlap between those two. What's interesting is recently, because the yield curve has started to steepen again, I've heard a lot of people say, well, the yield curve was sending a recession signal, but now it's not because it's becoming less inverted. And that again suggests you're not familiar with history because the signal of recession risk going up and becoming sort of more of a near-term phenomenon is actually when the steepening starts to happen. In fact, most recessions have started when the yield curve is no longer inverted. So it had the inversion and then it starts to steepen and move out of inversion. So this recent steepening isn't necessarily a signal that we're completely out of the woods and there's no risk of, uh, of recession. Um, and it's not uncommon for the stock market, again, as a leading indicator mm -hmm. to start to move up in anticipation of the Fed stopping the cycle and easing in the pressures associated with an inverted yield curve and, and so on. Ah, gotcha. So you you dove into recessions, and we've talked about that throughout several slides. This slide, uh, a popular uh, recession predictor, or is the Estrella and Michigan um, depiction. And you know this picture would show you. And again, the gray bars are recessions. So the the picture would suggest that the probability is quite high now. Um, Love to get your thoughts, and especially I know one of the terms that you've coined is uh, is rolling recessions. Right. So can you tell us about that? Sure. So we, we've been using that uh, term to describe this cycle for um, more than a year uh, now. And I touched on the unique aspect to this cycle earlier when we were talking about the lockdown phase of the pandemic and when the stimulus kicked in and how concentrated on the good side of the economy was, that's in essence also a, a descriptor or the starting point of this idea of a rolling recession where different segments of the economy have had contractions already. It's just been offset by strength elsewhere as opposed to a more traditional recession where Every, the bottom sort of falls out, not all at once, but but somewhat collectively. That certainly was the case with the COVID recession. Um, but even the global financial crisis, the real acute part of the weakness in the economy was concentrated in you know mid-2008 when the Lehman fell and the housing bubble burst, and it basically took down an over-leveraged financial system with it. And it was an all-at-once kind of phenomenon. This is one where strength was initially concentrated in goods and housing and consumer electronics uh, manufacturing, but then all of those segments went into their own recessions. You've just had the offsetting strength, later strength on the services side of the economy. Services is a larger employer, so that has helped keep the labor market afloat. So to me, the simplicity around recession versus no recession or recession versus soft landing misses the nuances of this cycle. And the fact that I think best case scenario, if we avoid an officially declared recession, it would be because the roll through continues. I think services will eventually get hit as will the labor market, but we might have offsetting stability or improvement in areas that have already gone through their own recession. So I, I just think you have to fine tooth comb this cycle a bit more because of the unique vagaries of the, of the pandemic. Very helpful. But I would say if somebody said, all right, Lizanne, yeah, 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 but you gotta, you gotta say yes or no. Will mm -hmm. the NBER, the official arbiters of recessions, at some point will they say it was a recession? I would say yes. Okay. Okay, so everybody on this call, or most people on this call, are, are fairly familiar with the efficient frontier, which says when you take on more risk. Um, there's more potential gains. And so you'd expect on, on this chart, it, it plots uh, the annualized five-year return from various asset classes in relation to their standard deviation. And the thing to notice on this chart is large caps uh, as represented by the S&P 500, the, um, the cross, the purple cross at the top, um, much higher standard returns in relation to a lot of other asset classes 
in relation to the risk associated or standard deviation. Um, tell us about this and do you expect this trend to continue where the efficient frontier is kind of broken? Well, I don't know that it, it's broken. I mean, you know, equities is inherently a uh, riskier asset class. Um, it generates higher returns over the long term, but with with more risk. Um, you know, a five year period of time is not a long history. Uh, and certainly the the last five years is anything but a normal five year period, <laughs> given <laughs> given COVID and, and the, the, the compression in the economy that was, you know, epic, even more extreme to a large degree than what we saw in the Great Depression, but really, really condensed. And the bear market associated with that was extreme, but five calendar weeks and even less in terms of, of trading days. So there's been a lot of skew that has happened with the data by virtue of, uh, of COVID. But I, I still think that there is a relationship between standard deviation, the amount of risk you have to take in returns. There's going to be times where, like last year, where you have a, a supposed safe asset class like fixed income, even within treasuries, and you got the double whammy of the market, the equity market being down a heck of a lot and the bond market being down a heck of a lot. So you didn't get that diversification benefit, but that's more of a one-off. That's not a sign of a new, new trend. I think where you have to be mindful of shifts in cycles, we've been in this kind of post-financial crisis era of the US equity market doing so much better than non-US um, equity markets. Um, those cycles don't last in perpetuity. They tend to be long, but they, they tend to shift when you go through a major global economic cycle and come out the other side, you tend to see a shift in, in leadership. And to some degree, we started to see a bit of that last year. Many non-US markets did quite well, and it's not, a message that, okay, it's time to sell all your US equity exposure and back up the truck and load up on all international. But it's been hard to sell the idea of diversification outside the United States. And it became hard to sell last year diversification relative to equities and things like fixed income. But that's back backward looking analysis. And, mm -hmm. and I think we are in an environment now where diversification is an absolute necessity, both across and within asset classes. And that includes in areas like international that haven't been strong performers until very recently and fixed income. Yes, it got drubbed last year, but the way the math works, that's that's not going to continue. So the, the, you know, the, the big headline at the end of last year of is 60-40 dead. Mm -hmm. um, that was a simplistic characterization. I, I think much of the analysis wasn't really 60, 40 specifically, 60 stocks, 40 bonds, but more of a label to depict having exposure on both the equity side of things and the fixed income side of things. And I think last year was a one-off and, and mm -hmm. I think we're back in an environment where you want to be diversified. Yeah. One of the themes that's emerging from your comments is be careful if you're drawing uh, if you're drawing trends or deducing things, make sure you're using a very large sample size or right. a you know your duration is long. You can come to the wrong conclusion or very different conclusions if you're looking at one month, one week, one year, or or five years than you would 100%. if you look at the duration. In fact, Sean, I think we talked about this um, on our prep call, uh, but. Somebody was um, doing a seminar somewhere and was talking about when the Fed finishes a hiking cycle mm -hmm. and actually said the word typical when saying the typical performance by the stock market once the Fed is done is, and then he you know, said, well, it goes up a little. And I thought, boy, that, that's not right. Um, there's, you, uh, to your exact point of mm -hmm. major interest rate cycles are not all that common. We've had 14 of them since the, the founding of the modern day Fed. And the range in terms of how the stock market is performed once the Fed finishes hiking rates in a cycle is so huge that there's nothing typical. Yes, you can draw an average line, mm -hmm. but when the average has, do the one year out point, Fed finishes, what does the market do a year later? The range of those 14 outcomes 
goes from minus 30% to plus 30%. Mm. That's a massive range. And it brings me back to another adage that I love. I don't know who to give credit to for saying this originally. It always shows up as anonymous, but um, analysis of an average leads to average analysis. Mm. So I'm so glad you brought up that point that you have to be really careful, especially if you're looking at any data that has a short time horizon or very few in the sample size and or a really wide range of historic outcomes. Yeah. A, a great dovetail into this slide, which, you know, uh, called a quilt slide, which shows in the columns various time horizons and it shows the best performing asset classes. Top is best, bottom is worse uh, over that time horizon. Um, you talked about diversification. Um, you know, longer time horizons, this reaches out to 10 years. Um, what should people be seeing in this chart? Because, you know, you can see that S&P 500 and U.S. Uh, growth uh, tend to be towards the top on average. Um, but what should we be seeing and noticing as investors about something like this? Well, if you go to the right hand side of this and you're looking at 10 year total return, it's not surprising to see some sort of growth larger cap index toward the top because of the relationship between earnings growth of companies and ultimately performance of those stocks. So given that this is a basket, whether it's Russell 1000 growth or S&P 500 of companies that are growing their earnings typically at a more rapid pace and a more consistently rapid pace than either the overall economy or other segments. So to see that is not surprising. Now, if you go further to the middle or the left side of this and you look at things like, you know, a three month return or a six month return or even a one year return, we've been in a, you know, a large cap dominated cycle. So those returns are going to show as bias. But if you were to go you know, there's versions of these quilts and we all use them. Um, you know, one of the ways that, that we show it is year by year. And on a year by year basis, particularly if you're looking over 15 or 20 year period of time, the colors are all over the place. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of the, the point of, of showing a quilt like this is about diversification and also being mindful of not chasing whatever kind of the hot asset class was, because inevitably you're going to have some sort of reversion uh, to the mean. Mm -hmm. So I think that I, I don't look at something like this and think, oh, you know, growth is going to stay in pole position. Mm -hmm. It certainly has been because we've been in a weaker economic environment and therefore companies that actually can still grow their earnings have done well. And over a really long period of time, growth companies do well, but I, I think when you segment it year by year or month by month, and we have a we have a version of this that is month by month of sectors. Mm. And again, you see the colors all over the place. And the point of these is when you like do a snapshot, look at them, you see the colors all over the place. And it's the model for diversification. Too often investors chase what's been at the top mm -hmm. and oftentimes right at the wrong time. Yeah, you mentioned a quote you're not sure who to attribute to. I, I have one that uh, uh, always sticks with me, which is um, diversification means always having to say you're sorry. Um, there, there's always something in a portfolio, a diversified That's portfolio well. that isn't doing well. And, but you know um, what the real benefit of diversification is? It's not the bragging rights of I nailed it. I was only in investments that went up. It's keeping you disciplined and in the game, yep. keeping you from panicking when the bottom falls out. And if you have all your eggs in one basket, particularly if you're doing it based on past performance, that's when you get tripped up. So diversification is there to keep you in the game, keep you disciplined. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also the, the really beautiful discipline of rebalancing. You know, periodic rebalancing is beautiful because it forces investors to do what we all know we're supposed to, which is mm -hmm. sort of a version of buy low, sell high. It's add low, trim high. And when left to our own devices, we often do the opposite. Yep. And it means your portfolio is telling you when it's time to do something. You're not 
figuring out whether, you know, which, you know, Yahoo on financial television is going to have the right bombastic call to get in or get out. That's not investing. That's just gambling. Very helpful. So we're in, um, we're, we're coming down the home stretch here, yep. our, our third topic. So we're uh, a couple weeks away from the end of Q2 earnings season. Just generally speaking, what, what have you seen or what, what were your perspectives from Q2 earnings? Yeah, so it's an interesting season because the, the metrics that are often most uh, acutely focused on are things like the beat rate percent of companies beating estimates mm -hmm. and the percent by which companies are beating. On both of those metrics, it was a strong earnings season. It was a like a 78, 79% beat rate so far and a 7.7% .7 rate by which companies are beating. Now, earnings are still in negative territory. There's a, there's a, a, a term called blended earnings. When you start getting reports and you go through the season, the various providers of consensus earnings information like Refinitiv or FactSet or IBES, they, they blend to give you an estimate for once the season is over. And it's a blend of companies that have already reported. So it's their actual numbers in the books with the estimates for the remainder of companies that haven't reported. Now we're close to the end of the season. So that blended estimate is much closer to being accurate than was the case at the beginning when it was all uh, estimates, but still looking at, at down three or 4% in terms of overall earnings growth. If you exclude the energy sector, S&P earnings are actually in positive territory. So the big drag this year is the energy sector. It was the big winner last year, but this year it's a, a, a big drag. But interestingly, the stocks that are beating are not performing well. Um, well below average for what typically stocks will do in the immediate aftermath of beating estimates. And that may be because revenues, nominal revenue growth for the S&P has hit the flat line. It's come down. Real revenues are deep in negative territory. Mm -hmm. And the beat rate on revenues is well below average, which what that means, what you can infer from that is the beats on earnings have come because of cost cutting not because of underlying strength in the economy. And I think that's been the focus that has explained both the consolidation period we seem to be in in the market, especially some of the high flyers. It's doing a little more digging and looking at not just bottom line, but also top line, not just nominal, but also real. Yeah, very interesting. Um, and, and it's back to your uh, better or worse, not better or worse or matters bad. more than good or bad, right? Yep. You know, what's interesting on the earnings front, if you look at how the stock market is performed in various earnings zones, mm -hmm. maybe no surprise, the worst stock market performance has come when earnings are down by more than 20% year over year. That's, mm -hmm. that's like crush territory, deep recession type territory. But the second worst performance has come when earnings are up more than 20%. Mm. The best performance has come when earnings are down between negative 20% and flat. And it's that acceleration out of the trough. It's that inflection point. The market has an uncanny ability to figure out when things, in this case earnings, stop getting worse and they start getting better. At the point that they're booming again, the market sniffs out, you know what? It doesn't get better from here. We're closer to an inflection point where things start to get worse. And that what is what tends to trigger the market. So um, it, it, it's just counterintuitive given we know the connection between earnings and, and stock prices, but there's that leading nature of the equity market mm -hmm. and what it anticipates at inflection points. Got it. So this chart tries to show the Magnificent Seven uh, as a equally weighted basket, you know, or sleeve. Apple, Alphabet, Amazon, Microsoft, Meta, uh, Tesla, and Nvidia, and it shows that in relation to a couple of the indices. Um, what are your perspectives here, and and how this, you know, something like this ties into a diversified portfolio? So it is not uncommon for a somewhat small 
portion of a cap weighted index like the S&P or like the NASDAQ or the NASDAQ 100 um, to drive a, a, a big chunk of the performance. That's just the nature of cap weighted indexes and the companies that become larger weights are typically doing so because they've got outsized earnings growth and, and dominance in, in their marketplace. But it can get to an extreme where it's not just about the concentrated performance in a small handful of names, but what the rest of the market is doing in relative terms. And that became a significant problem. Well, really, we go back to, to March 8th, and this may sound like it's an arbitrary date, but that was the date when Silicon Valley failed and started what I guess we don't call a banking crisis anymore. I think Jamie Dimon calls it a banking incident now, but that was really the, the, the real launch for when the market became very heavily concentrated. And I think it was a confluence of things. Uh-oh, we need big companies that have strong balance sheets and lots of cash flow. They're, they've sort of been this era's defensive type uh, names going back to the lockdown pandemic era. So, and then you had the AI kicker, uh, of course. But the problem um, really hit an extreme in the very beginning of June, June 1st to be precise. You had more than all the performance in the S&P accounted for by these names, but also important was only 15% of the S&P 500's constituents were outperforming the index itself over the prior 60 day period of time. That was a record low. So it was the combination of the concentration on the upside and the complete lack of participation elsewhere. It's the, it goes to that, that old battlefront analogy. If you've just got a few generals on the front line and the soldiers have fallen way behind, that's not a strong front. If you have even fewer generals, but the soldiers start moving to the front line, that's a stronger front. So what we've started to see is actually initially we saw convergence. I thought healthy convergence. We started to see some pullback in those areas, but we were seeing improving breadth from kind of the, the, the bottom up. That has faltered a little bit. Now I think we're actually in some sort of consolidation or corrective phase. So breadth kind of everywhere has rolled over. But this is not an unhealthy development because I think the sentiment froth that started to develop was very much tied to this concentration issue. And for investors who aren't mindful of it and, and don't do periodic rebalancing, you end up or chase, you know, FOMO kicks in. The concentration brings with it uh, a risk. And to some degree, we're not seeing an extreme version of the other side of that. But this consolidation is a good reminder that Periods like that don't last in perpetuity. Got it. So we have two slides to go. And I, I think you, you, you might kill me a little bit on this one, but this slide is meant to depict what happens in the next 10 months after a bear market. And if you look at these numbers and you average averages, which you know is problematic in itself, it says, if you happen to be able to perfectly time a market and its trough, uh, the next 10 months are gonna be glorious and on average above 40%. So be kind to me, Lizanne, but share, okay. share, share with me your thoughts on this. Well, again, small sample size average doesn't tell you a heck of a lot. This is also looking at the dates of bear market bottoms with the pure benefit of hindsight. Uh, it's also the case that if you look at some of the longer duration bear markets, like the one from March of 2000 to October of 2002, or the one from October of 2007 to March of 2009, if you're going to use the call it traditional definition of a move up off a low of at least 20% as a bull market, a move down from a high of at least 20% as a bear market, the 2000 to 2002 cycle was actually three separate cycles. It's just with the benefit of hindsight, we now think of it as sort of one long bear market from ultimate peak to ultimate bottom. But there were interim cycles within that at the time you were in one of the cyclical bulls, you didn't know whether that had been the bottom and you were off to the races. Uh, we only now know with the calendar and charts and the benefit of hindsight. And, and the 07 to 09 was sort of two cycles uh, throughout. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I don't know whether last October um, was the ultimate low. 
Um, frankly, I don't, it doesn't matter to me that I don't know, because I know I don't know. Nobody does. <laughs> and I don't want to say it doesn't matter. In a perfect world, somebody could tell us the exact tops and bottoms, and this would be really fruitful and fun. And but that's not how that's not investing. That's just gambling on moments in time. I will say that the behavior of the market since last October is actually consistent with the behavior of markets coming out of not just bear markets, but recessions. And some would say, but we haven't had a recession. Well, we've had a recession in some parts of the economy. Mm. So maybe it ties into the whole rolling recession. The other thing very specific to this bull market, whether it's just a cyclical bull and an ongoing bear, again, I don't know, is the total lack of participation by the financials. We're so focused on tech and as long as tech is in some semblance of leadership, you know, we're golden, but with no participation by financials, that suggests there's, there's a real missing ingredient in the financial market of equities when there's no participation mm -hmm. on the part of uh, financials. So uh, that's certainly one of the things that I'm keeping an eye on is trying to get some greater participation by financials that would make me feel a bit better about where we are in this market cycle. Yeah, I, I started out this webinar by saying I was fairly certain people are going to learn some things. And I will tell you, the thing I've learned about people who truly understand markets like you do, Lizanne, is you say, I don't know a lot because you have, a, I guess, a full appreciation for all the nuance and all the subtleties involved and that nobody's got a crystal ball. And if yep. they did, they would be a gazillionaire at That's this right. point in time. So. And even some of the most prescient folks who do uh, make it a point um, to, you know, garner attention or their firms require them to do what I think is silly exercises like year-end price targets, and you know, they'll 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 have a string of great calls, but inevitably they'll have those bad calls, and and no one should be trading on that. You know, again, get in, get out, all or nothing. That that's just gambling. Um, mm -hmm. Investing should be a disciplined process all the time. It may not be good TV, mm -hmm. figuratively, yeah. um, but it's what, I don't know any successful investor that has gotten that by trying to you know, pick tops and bottoms to the day and, and taking making all or nothing decisions. That's not investing. Yeah, there's probably a reason there's not a show called uh, Diversify and Rebalance. Yeah, it's um, a little more boring. Yeah, we, we <laughs> but have it's a small what matters. audience. Yep, yep. <laughs> Well, let, let's, let's close with uh, since the end of May, this has been the performance of some of the major indices. Um, anything we should be thinking about in, in relation to the last several months as it relates to the next few months ahead? Yeah, so as I mentioned, the initially when we sort of finished May and you really developed that heavy concentration issue where all, more than all the performance was concentrated among those, you know, super seven, magnificent eight category of, of names, that felt like there was a risk of some convergence. And that's really what happened in June, where you had convergence. So you had some kind of catch down by some of those high flyers and catch up by many other areas, small caps got a bit of a, of a bid. Now I think we're in more of a true consolidation period. I don't know that it turns into a full-blown correction, but I think it reflects the, the breakout on the upside of yields, the concerns that maybe the Fed isn't done because we're just not seeing the weakness in the economy that I think the Fed would like to see to cement that inflation is coming down. Uh, so that's kind of hitting everything. What I would say looking uh, ahead is, I think this is an environment where it's you don't wanna be monolithic and say, now is time to buy you know, small caps. Russell 2000 is the common benchmark for small caps. That's a huge index of companies and there are gonna be huge winners in there and huge losers. And I don't think this is an environment where you can be monolithic at the index level at the style level, at the sector level. And it goes back to the important shift that's happened from a macro perspective. The Fed has come up off the zero bound. 
with interest rates. Global central banks have come off the negative bound. We have the return of the risk-free rate. The era of zero interest rates was an era of limited price discovery, capital misallocation, breeding ground for zombie companies. It really moved everything to be monolithic. You could just buy the cap-weighted indexes and do well, passive, just trounced active. And I think we're transitioning into a different environment where fundamentals are reconnected to prices. And I think you wanna be careful about making monolithic index decisions or sector decisions, but invest, invest based on actual characteristics, factors as we call them, um, you know, strong balance sheet, strong free cash flow, self-funding companies, companies with pricing power, and apply the analysis, the screening, where you look for them across the spectrum of small cap, large cap, you know, growth, value, tech, utilities, et cetera. And so I, I think it's a, it's a different landscape. I think it's a more level playing field for active managers mm -hmm. relative to passive. I think equal weight probably has more bouts about performance than just cap weight dominating. So I think it's an important shift um, that in many ways is, is a benefit to uh, individual investors in particular. Awesome. Well, that's the end of our slides. And, and let me just conclude this by saying, um, Lizanne, uh, just uh, a, a wealth of knowledge. And, mm -hmm. and I mentioned this to you the other day. Every time I've heard you speak, I, I felt like I was getting a really efficient capital markets MBA all over again. <laughs> so, so thank you. I did want to take just a couple minutes and see if there are any questions. Uh, my colleague, Tanya, are, are there any questions we might uh, pose to Lizanne from our audience? Yes, so we did get one question. As globalization has increased in recent decades, there has been a significant participation in U.S. stock by foreign investors. What impact has this had on volatility in U.S. equity markets? So that has been um, a, a fairly powerful force of, of foreign exposure to U.S. equities. That is now starting to roll over a bit, and it's in conjunction with a rolling over in terms of foreign exposure to U.S. treasuries. It's sort of this more of a diversification story. Sometimes it gets wrapped into the de-dollarization and the dollar is going to lose its reserve status. That's, that's sort of a nonsensical, um, almost conspiracy theory. Um, but there is diversification happening and uh, not just by individual investors, institutional investors, but foreign central banks. And I, I think we'll probably continue to see some movement away from U.S. markets, especially as the global interest rate environment continues to normalize. And there's less, there's more diversification in terms of, of trade. So it's not as much trade being done in US dollars. So there's less money that automatically has to be invested back in treasuries. But this is a slow moving process. This is not the bottom's going to fall out. And you know, China and Japan are going to suddenly dump all their US equities and US treasuries. They that would be aiming the gun squarely at their own economic foot. But it's a slow process of some diversification, which has already started and I think for the most part will continue. Great. Thank you, Lizanne. Hey, Lizanne, if anybody in our audience that's on now or going to watch the recorded version wants to kind of continue to hear your perspectives through time, what's the best way for them to continue to learn from you? So for the traditional research that we put out, written reports, videos, other commentary, volatility type commentary, what a lot of people don't realize is that it's on the public site of Schwab.com. You don't have to be a Schwab client. We don't put it behind the login firewall. But to be perfectly honest, efficient access to not just that traditional stuff, but day to day, minute to minute, stream of consciousness, reaction to economic reports, charts galore. Um, I guess we don't say Twitter anymore is, is via my X feed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I still am going to call it Twitter, the Twitter feed, because it is, it's every day, it's tons of information, but it's also where 
I post links to the more formal written reports, to the monthly videos that I do, to volatility commentary. So it's one-stop uh, shopping. Just make sure you're following the actual me because I've had a rash of imposters uh, recently. And, and I know those imposters aren't going to come off anywhere near as smart. So it shouldn't <laughs> be hard to tell the imposter accounts. But Lizanne, thank you very much My for pleasure. spending an hour thank educating you. me and, and those watching. Truly appreciate it. Thanks for having me.